So, welcome everybody. It's my absolutely great pleasure to have Ryan Alvarado here, who is in Amherst College. And he will talk about the characterization of the sublet embedding theorem in metric measure spaces. Great, great. Thank you, Armin. And, and, and thank you to the organizers uh, for the kind invitation. It's, uh, it's nice to talk about some mathematics in a time when uh, basically all uh, seminars are, are canceled in person. So I should mention first that uh, everything in this talk uh, is joint work with uh, Shemek Gorka, who's at University of uh, Warsaw, uh, Polytechnic University in Warsaw, Poland, and Piotr Hiwash, who's at the University of, of Pittsburgh. So as Armin mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about Sobolev spaces in a rather general environment. Uh, so before we get there, maybe it, it's appropriate to just quickly review what we mean by Sobolev spaces in the classical setting of Rn. So recall that if you have a domain, uh, omega and some exponent bigger, bigger than or equal to one, we define uh, the first order Sobolev space W1P on omega as a collection of all functions U belonging to the vague space LP with the property that their gradient taken in the sense of distributions is also in LP, okay? Of course, there's a higher ordered theory, but for the purposes of this talk, the first order derivatives is all that we're gonna need, okay? Now, this space can be turned into a Banach space when you equip it with the following norm, which encodes information about both U and its gradient measured here in the, in the LP norm. Okay. One of the uh, classic uh, or fundamental results in the theory of Sobolev spaces is that of the Sobolev embedding theorem, which highlights the fact that uh, functions coming from W1P have certain nice properties depending on the relationship between the integrability exponent p and the uh, dimension of the underlying space, in this case, n, okay? So to state it, uh, let's suppose I have a ball, so a nice domain with radius r. When p is less than n, then w1p embeds into lp star. And when embed, I mean there's control over the lp star norm of u in terms of the w1p uh, uh, norm. And here P star is given by this formula, NP divided by N minus P, uh, which is sometimes referred to as the uh, Sobolev exponent, okay? In addition to uh, this embedding, it's known that functions in W1P satisfy the following sobolev poincare inequality. Um, here, where I uh, use this barred notation to represent the integral average, which I've stated here with an arbitrary measure uh, mu. Uh, in addition, I'll use this uh, inequality with the tilde underneath to say that the inequality is true up to a uh, multiplicative constant independent of some of the major uh, variables in the uh, inequality, okay? Now, when p equals n in this critical case, uh, we get something slightly different. We get exponential integrability of the function u, sometimes referred to as the Trudinger inequality. And when p is larger than the dimension, then the function u turns out to be held or continuous of order one minus n over p, which follows from this inequality right here. Now I've stated the Sobolev embedding theorem for uh, balls, but one can replace a ball with a domain provided the domain under consideration is sufficiently regular. For example, if it's a Lipschitz domain or even more generally a John domain, for example, like a von Koch snowflake. And perhaps it's not of much surprise uh, that the geometry of the underlying domain actually plays a pivotal role in establishing uh, embedding theorems on uh, these domains, okay? Um, and there's been uh, several papers sort of aimed at trying to identify what is the optimal degree of regularity the domain should exhibit in order to guarantee the availability of these theorems. Um, I really wish to only mention one here um, in the sea of them, uh, and that's a result due to Buckley and Koskala that says if you have a simply connected bounded planar domain, and you know the domain satisfies a, a P Sobolev Poincaré inequality with the appropriate values of P, then the domain necessarily satisfies this John condition, which can be thought of as like a, a weak carrot type condition. I'm not going to get into the specifics of it. Um, they actually have a slightly more general result in the setting of Rn in the category of domains satisfying what they call a separation property. Um, what's most important about this result is we can see that if one expects to have a Sobolev embedding of some type, then we have to expect something from the underlying domain. Okay. And the main aims of the current work are to complement uh, results such as this uh, by trying to further clarify the relationship between the properties of the underlying space omega and the availability of these uh, embedding theorems. So in particular, we have the following question. For a general domain, 
if you know the domain supports a Sobolev embedding for some P, what, if anything, can you say about uh, the properties of the underlying domain? Now, one of the first results aimed at answering this came in 2008 with the result of Hiwash Koskola and Tuminen. Um, in a paper uh, appeared in Journal of Functional Analysis. And to state it uh, concisely, let me go ahead and just introduce uh, this uh, measure condition, this lower measure bound, where here L to the power N is the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure. So this condition is sometimes referred to as a lower Alfors regularity condition with the exponent uh, N here. And what it's really sort of encoding in it is that balls centered at domain points uh, have a significant enough portion of the domain line inside of it, okay, relative to the scale uh, R. Okay? In particular, the domain would not have an outward pointing cusp, for example, if it were to satisfy, uh, satisfy this condition. And Lipschitz domains and John domains both satisfy this condition. Um, now, as the point moves closer to the boundary, what this condition is really saying is that the boundary uh, of the domain is somewhat thick. And so some people refer to this as an N thick domain as well, okay? So what does their result say? When P is less than N, if you know, if you assume that there is an embedding of W1P into LP star with the correct exponent P star, then the domain omega necessarily satisfies this lower measure bound. And something similar for the case P equals N, if there's a Trudinger type inequality, then indeed the lower measure bound is satisfied on omega. And similarly, if there is a Helder embedding with the appropriate uh, exponent, again, the measure satisfies uh, this lower measure bound. So we can see that here, all Sobolev embedding domains fit into this larger class of these n-thick domains. Okay. I want to give just a sort of a, a, a brief idea of the proof so that you can see how, how results of this nature uh, can, be, can be established. So there's two sort of main ingredients uh, in this proof. Um, and that is uh, the ability to construct a family of balls satisfying a certain property. So what are they interested in? Well, you want to prove the lower measure bound for a given ball. Um, so if you fix the ball, you construct a family of concentric balls shrinking down to the point X, where at each stage, the measure of the ball intersected the domain is precisely half the measure of the ball from the previous generation. And so here it's just one snapshot starting with R and then going one generation down R tilde. They also use the fact that there exists a smooth bum function uh, associated with this collection of balls. Namely that you can find a C infinity, a compactly supported function, which is identically one on the smaller ball, vanishes outside of the larger ball, and that the rate of decay is bounded above by the distance between the inner ball and the complement of the larger ball, okay? So let's just give a quick sketch of the proof P less than N. So in this case, we have this uh, measure condition from the, from the previous slide. So since I have a C infinity compactly supported function, this is a function belonging to W1P. And since we're assuming that W1P embeds into LP star, we have this inequality. Now, you can bound the left-hand side from below by simply shrinking the domain of integration to the smaller ball where the function phi is identically one and get this trivial estimate. And on the upper hand side, you can use the estimates on the gradient to bound the Sobolev uh, norm above by, by this quantity. So at this stage, you have R tilde on the left hand side and R on the right hand side. And we bring in this measure condition to rewrite the left hand side, left -hand side in terms of the measure of the ball with radius R. Okay. Then just looking at the extreme most sides of the inequality and solving, keeping in mind how the exponents relate to one another, we get precisely this. Okay. So we have an estimate on the difference between this R and this R tilde. So that is one stage. And now we can continue this iteration process by simply starting with R and then go in with R tilde, R tilde, tilde, so on and so forth. And it can easily be seen by induction that the, the measure of the ball with radius Rj is exactly two to the power minus J of the measure of the original ball. And since these rj's tend to zero, we can rewrite r as a telescoping sum. And each one of these terms can be estimated above uh, using a, a similar argument to one that we've just seen to get precisely uh, a bound from above of the Lebesgue measure to the power one over n of the original ball. Taking power both sides to the power n, we have exactly the lower measure bound that we want. So for 
The other ca uh, cases, p equals n and p bigger than n, the philosophy is somewhat the same, but the details are, 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 are different given the nature of the inequalities that one is, is assuming. So as I said before, you can see that Sobolev embedding implies something about the underlying measure, um, but it's known that this measure condition is not enough to guarantee that the domain satisfies uh, a Sobolev embedding. And so now we have the following questions. To what extent could, if any, this measure type condition be used to characterize Sobolev embeddings? And then maybe from the perspective of applications, if such a characterization uh, in terms of the measure were to exist, what is the most general geometric and measure theoretic setting that such a, uh, a characterization could uh, be established? Well, the most general setting where this problem even has a meaningful formulation is that of analysis on metric measure spaces, which is a field that has grown in considerable popularity uh, since the mid 90s um, and has led to a rather fruitful, fruitful theory. But if you think about wanting to discuss Sobolev embedding theorems, we need a good notion of Sobolev space in this environment, which would bring you to an immediate wall because Sobolev spaces are defined via the gradient. How would one introduce a suitable notion of a Sobolev space without a notion of a gradient? Well, it turns out that for much of the Sobolev uh, uh, theory of Sobolev spaces, information about the specific gradient is not necessary, but rather it's enough to have information about the modulus of the gradient. And kind of from this perspective, there have been rather um, uh, uh, some rather successful uh, uh, notions of Sobolev spaces introduced. And I'll just mention a few of them here. So the first uh, was due to Hiwaj, uh, who introduced a, a notion of Sobolev space by a, a Lipschitz type condition. Koskal and Hiwaj introduced the P1P spaces using Poincaré inequalities. Naga Shamunalingam introduced the so-called Newtonian spaces via upper gradients, and Cheeger introduced the, these Cheeger spaces using uh, sequences of upper gradients. Okay? Now, regarding how these spaces relate to one another, if you have a metric measure space with a, a doubling measure, with, if you're not familiar with a doubling measure, it's just a growth condition on, on uh, the measure, then the spaces have the following arrangement, with M1 P spaces being the smallest and the, the Newtonian, hence also the Cheeger spaces being the largest, all of which are subspaces of LP, just like their Euclidean counterpart. Now, if your space is sufficiently nice, like say it's complete doubling measure supports a P-Poincaré inequality for P bigger than one, then all the spaces coincide. In particular, all these spaces on all of Rn with the Lebesgue measure and the Euclidean metric all equal each other and equal the classical Sobolev space. So we see that each of these are a suitable sort of replacement for W1P in the classical sense in this general setting. Now, um, as it turns out that if your space is very rough, like for example, a totally disconnected set like the Cantor set, or if you're in a space where there's no non-constant rectifiable curves, like say the Von Koch snowflake, the Newtonian spaces become all of LP. So in a sense, the theory is trivial, whereas the M1P spaces still retain a rather uh, a fruitful theory. And so from this perspective um, of applications and generality, we're going to, to work with the high wash notion of Sobolev spaces. So how do we define these spaces? So suppose I have a metric measure space and any exponent in between zero and infinity could be fractional and could be uh, less than one. Then M1P is the collection of all functions U belonging to LP with the property that this Lipschitz type condition holds for some uh, non-negative function G. Um, it's not hard to convince yourself that G is, is, is not unique and so we can consider the the collection of all functions G uh, for which this inequality holds almost everywhere. Now the space M1P can be equipped with the following norm. I put norm in, in quotations here, uh, mainly because when P is less than one, it's not a norm, it, it satisfies a quasi-triangle inequality, okay? But nevertheless, M1P is a complete space uh, under this norm. And like its Euclidean counterpart includes information about both the size of U and its gradient, which is being played by the role of G here uh, in, in its uh, definition. And of course, since G is not unique, we have this infimum here running over all of G. When P is bigger than one, as I said before, M1P on all of Rn in, is equal to W1P. And in this case, uh, if you're in W1P, the function G is actually paid, 
played uh, by a localized Hardy Littlewood maximal operator of the modulus of the gradient. And if omega is sufficiently nice, uh, these two spaces also coincide. But in general, M1P is a smaller space than, than W1P. Okay. Now, one of the nice things about M1P spaces is that they uh, also uh, satisfy these embedding theorems. So in 96, Hiwash proved the following result. If you have a bounded metric measure space, and you suppose for some positive exponent s, the measure satisfies this lower inequality, then for any p strictly less than this s, m1p on all of x embeds into lp star of all of x, where p star is this sp minus s, sp divided by s minus p. So you can see here this s appearing in the lower measure bound is replacing the role of the dimension in the Euclidean setting. Okay? And by embedding, again, you have control over the lp star norm of u in terms of both u and its gradient in terms of the LP norm, okay? So we can ask the following question, which is, is, is sort of the analogous version of the result of Hiwash, Koskala, and Tuminen in the Euclidean setting. And that is, if we were to assume that we have a, a Sobolev embedding, does that imply anything about the underlying measure? And indeed, the answer is yes. And it came in the affirmative in 2017 uh, with the result of Gorka, who proved that if you have a metric measure space with a doubling measure, and you assume for P less than S that M1P on all of X embeds into LP star with the appropriate exponent, then indeed the measure satisfies this lower measure bound. And I'll sort of stress here that the doubling was actually an, an, an important part of, of his proof and that the proof itself is different than the one uh, that I showed you earlier of Hiwash, Koskala, and Tumen. It's a different circle of ideas. But what's interesting about this result is that the conclusion of this theorem is actually absent of, at, uh, absence of the doubling condition whatsoever. So what do I mean? The constant k appearing in the conclusion here in this measure condition does not depend on the doubling constant. So although the proof itself depends on the doubling property, there's no uh, uh, sort of trace of it in the conclusion, which begs the natural question. Is the doubling property of the measure actually important to the conclusion of this theorem, or is it just an artifact of the techniques uh, employed by Gorka? And as you might expect, since I'm asking it, uh, the measure being doubling is not necessary. In fact, um, Gorka Hiwash and myself, we, we proved uh, the same conclusion with the right exponent s here without the doubling. And you can do it by going back to the Hiwash, Koskala, and Tuminen result and appropriately modifying it. And what do I mean? So remember that in, in their proof, it was an important ingredient to be able to construct this family of, of balls, which stated for the general measure would amount to exactly this equality. But as it turns out that in the general metric uh, measure space, there's no reason to expect that such equality would hold for an R tilde. So there may not exist an R tilde in uh, such a general setting. But if you look at the largest ball R tilde satisfying this inequality, we can replace equality for inequality and appropriately modify their argument to get this conclusion, okay? So where do things stand at this moment? Well, if we combine this result here with Hiwaj's 96 result, for a bounded metric measure space, M1P on all of X embedding into LP star is equivalent to the lower bound of the measure with the fixed exponent S, okay? So the story is done for bounded metric measure spaces, but the question still remains for what about unbounded metric measure spaces or what about the case P equals S or P bigger than S? For both of those questions, one could add additional assumptions on the metric measure space to get the result to go through and sort of recycle uh, sort of techniques from the Euclidean setting. But we didn't want to artificially introduce any additional assumptions um, just to get the result to hold. And it turns out that the correct perspective for us was not to look at M1P on all of X embedding to LP star, but actually look at what we call the local embedding. So meaning looking at embeddings holding on, on all balls. And the result is as follows. So suppose I have a uniformly perfect metric measure space, which if you're not familiar with it, basically amounts to certain families of annuli being non-empty. The key property for us about uniformly perfect 
spaces is uh, the fact that uniformly perfect spaces do not have any isolated points. Uh, every connected space is uniformly perfect, but totally disconnected sets like the Cantor set are also uniformly perfect, okay? Just to give you an idea of the set. So suppose we have this uh, dilation factor, which we'll call sigma, and P is less than S. Then we manage to prove that the following statements are equivalent. Mu satisfies the lower measure bound with this fixed exponent S. M1P on the dilated ball embeds into LP star on the little ball for all balls B. And in addition, this following Sobolev inequality holds true. And lastly, the following Sobolev Poincare type inequality holds for M1P spaces. Okay? So just a couple of remarks at, at this stage. So you see that we have the sigma on the right hand side and just the ball on the left hand side. So the sigma being strictly bigger than one uh, is really there because we're in such a general environment. If we knew a little bit more about the underlying space, sigma could be taken to be one. In addition, there's these multiplicative factors of this measure of the sigma b over r to the power s. And again, if we knew a little bit more about the measure, those factors could go away. But what's important about two and three is it's encoding information about u and the LP star norm in terms of u and its gradient in the LP sense, okay? Uh, what's new here um, is really two and three implies one. So the fact that these embeddings on balls imply the lower measure bound and that one implies two. Okay? Hiawaj in 2003 had proved that one implies three. Okay, so that a sobolev poincare inequality holds on all balls provided you assume the lower measure bound. Okay, so that's the case P less than S. And uh, maybe I'll mention here again, uh, or uh, rather for the first time, I guess, if P is sufficiently large, like say bigger than S over S plus one, it turns out that U is locally integrable and we can replace this infimum on the last line here uh, with uh, just simply the integral average uh, of U minus the average of U on the ball, okay? So it looks a little bit more like the sobolev poincare inequality that you would see in the Euclidean setting. Okay, so regarding the P equals S and P bigger than S, uh, the exact same assumptions. And number one here, uh, the measure bound is equivalent to the following exponential uh, integrability condition as well as the following Helder embedding, okay? So I couldn't fit it all on one side, um, but really this is a, a, a sort of five part theorem here uh, which says that the measure bound with fixed exponent S is equivalent to any of these embeddings uh, with respect to, to, to P in the corresponding spaces. So a nice consequences of this is that if a Sobolev embedding theorem holds for a given value of P, then it holds in all cases for all values of P. Okay, so it's a sort of self-improvement property of these embeddings. So they're all equivalent in the category of M1P spaces. Okay, um, and I'll mention here that again, for the case, well, really the Sobolev Poincare, as well as the case P equals S and P bigger than S, we were not able to uh, recycle in this general environment the arguments of Hiwash, Koskola, and Tuminen, and a new circle of ideas were needed. And they were actually based on techniques introduced by uh, Korobenko, Moldonado, and Rios um, in a result that I'll sort of mention later in the talk. Okay. So um, I wanna talk how our results look in the setting of doubling metric measure spaces where these inequalities have a little bit cleaner uh, formulation. So let's recall that a measure is said to be doubling provided you have control over these concentric dilates of the ball with a fixed constant CD, which I'll call the doubling constant. And a closely related uh, condition here, which I'll refer to as S doubling, um, means this quantitative sort of inequality holds, okay? And if you look at it, what you can think of this is that the lower measure bound holds with exponent S within this ball BX0, R0, okay? It may not be too hard to convince yourself that every S doubling measure is indeed doubling, right? Take X not to be X, take R0 to be 2R. On the left-hand side, you get a constant. Solving over, you get doubling. It takes a little bit of work, but again, it's not, uh, it is rather straightforward to see that every S doubling measure, or every doubling measure, I'm sorry, is S doubling for any S bigger than log base two of the doubling constant, okay? So these two conditions are equivalent 
but it's the latter condition, the s doubling condition, that has this exponent s, and it's this sort of quantitative nature of the second inequality that will be important when discussing the Sobolev embedding theorem, because we need some sort of role of the, uh, the dimension. Okay? So Hiwash proved the following embeddings in the doubling metric case in 2003. If you have a doubling measure, then for all, ball, all, all functions m1p on a dilated ball, and for all balls, I have the following Sobolev inequality and sobolev poincare inequality, where again, if p is sufficiently large, uh, we can replace the infimum uh, on the left-hand side of, of the sobolev poincare type inequality. Okay? So you see here that in the doubling metric measure space, these inequalities are uh, more akin to the Euclidean counterpart. For the case p equals s, again, there's this Trudinger type inequality with appropriate change of constants, and p bigger than s, Functions in M1P uh, for sufficiently large uh, P have held their uh, continuous representatives of, of the appropriate power. Okay. So as with the lower measure bound, uh, the question is, does this S doubling property actually characterize these local M1P sub 11 embeddings in the context of, of, of these doubling metric measure spaces? And indeed, the answer is yes. Um, but I do really wish to, to, to mention the result of Korbenko, uh, Moldonado, and Rios at this stage, because it's a beautiful result uh, that was crucial to, to getting what we wanted out of, out, of, out, of, out of this question. So suppose you have a metric measure space. And suppose that you have this inequality, this Sobolev type inequality, where on the left-hand side, you have some Q bigger than P. Okay? And on the right-hand side, uh, the LP norms. Okay? And suppose this, this, this inequality holds for all functions M1P on the dilated ball or potentially dilated ball and for all uh, of its upper gradients here, G. Then they concluded that the measure is necessarily doubling. Okay? And the idea was this beautiful iteration technique um, that we were able to use for our purposes. But how does this result fit into what we have? Well, you can see that what's highlighted here is very similar to what we, what we are assuming with the Sobolev inequality, but not with Q, but with some P star, okay? So can this result be used to prove that S doubling measures can characterize Sobolev embeddings? And the answer is not quite, not off the shelf. And why? Suppose that you have an S doubling measure, then by Hiwash's embedding result, we have the above inequality to be satisfied with Q equals the Sobolev exponent. So by the result of Korobanko, Moldonado, and Rios, we get that the measure is just doubling in no quantitative sense. So by this iterative technique, we get S tilde doubling for some S tilde strictly bigger than S. And given the relationship between the radii, the S tilde doubling when S tilde is larger than S is actually a weaker condition. So we don't get quite back to S tilde doubling. Okay? So something is lost in a quantitative sense if we take their shelf off uh, take the result off the shelf. Okay? And so the idea for us to answer the question in which we're interested is to go back to this result and extract from it, um, or maybe carefully go through the technique, I'll say, to be able to extract or hold on to the quantitative aspects of the theory. And upon doing so, we were able to obtain the following result. Again, a uniformly perfect metric measure space. And in the case P less than S, we were able to prove that this S doubling property is equivalent to the following Sobolev inequality holds on all balls and the following Sobolev Poincare inequality, which again, for sufficiently large P, gives us the Sobolev Poincare inequality that we'd be a little bit more used to seeing in the Euclidean setting. Okay? So for M1P functions, Sobolev inequality and Sobolev Poincare are equivalent and both equivalent to the S doubling with the fixed power of S. For P bigger than S, we also do get an equivalence between the Helder type embedding and the S doubling. But the technique that we employ here actually breaks down for the critical case P equals S. And what do I mean? If we utilize the techniques uh, for the other two results, we get the following uh, conclusion. Assuming the correct exponential or Trudinger type inequality, we can only show that the measure is S plus epsilon doubling for any epsilon bigger than zero. And as that epsilon tends to zero, the constants in this S doubling property actually blow up, okay? So we can get close to S doubling, but not quite S doubling. 
So in particular, the measure is doubling, but just not with the correct exponent. And now we feel that the result is true, and really the conclusion being as weak as it is, is only a manifestation of the techniques. Different techniques are, are, are known, are, are needed here. Um, and we're sort of currently working on, on and sort of proving that uh, with the exponent s. Okay? So the, the question is kind of interesting in the Trudinger case. So let me bring it back uh, full circle to uh, the result of Hiawash Koskala Tumanin in the Euclidean setting, okay? Which was stated if you have W1P embeddings, then you have the lower measure bound for the Lebesgue measure, okay? So how does this result fit into, or how, how, maybe I should say, how do our results in the metric measure setting fit into to the story initiated uh, here? So suppose you have a domain with p less than n, so let's look at the case p less than n, the Sobolev exponent, then our result formulated in the Euclidean setting is as follows. The Lebesgue measure satisfies the lower measure bound with exponent n on the domain, so the domain is n thick, is equivalent to the following Sobolev inequality for m1p functions and the sobolev poincare inequality for m1p functions. And if you happen to know that the, uh, the domain is, is, is in addition bounded, uh, then in fact, these three conditions are further equivalent to the global embedding of M1P on all of omega into LP star of omega. So we see that this measure condition, although not strong enough alone to characterize W1P embeddings, it is enough to characterize M1P embeddings on the domain. Okay? And that sort of brings the uh, first portion of, of this talk uh, into a natural conclusion, okay? So uh, in the second part, uh, I really wanna talk about this technique that we used to show that these M1P embeddings imply lower measure bound on the measure, how these techniques can be used to obtain results about spaces supporting a P-Poncare inequality, which will then lead us into a characterization of what are called P-admissible weights in the Euclidean setting. So let me first just review for you quickly, what does it mean for a space to satisfy a p poincare inequality? So suppose you have a metric measure space and some measurable function u will say that a non-negative measurable function g is an upper gradient of u if the following inequality holds uh, point-wise, where the integral is taken over a curve, a rectifiable curve joining the points x and y. So in some sense, a, a generalization of the fundamental theorem of calculus in this setting then we'll say that a space X supports a QP Poincaré inequality for some exponents QP bigger than or equal to one, provided the following inequality holds true. So we've seen up until this point a Sobolev Poincaré inequality where Q is the Sobolev exponent. And so this is sort of a more general family of, of inequalities here, okay? And when Q is equal to one, we'll simply say that instead of saying a one P Poincaré inequality, we'll just call it a P Poincaré. Now, uh, it follows immediately from Helder's inequality that the smaller the exponent p on the right-hand side or the larger the exponent q on the left-hand side, the stronger this inequality becomes. Now, a result which sort of clarifies a bit about the relationship between the different values of q and p in these inequalities came in 95 with Hiwaj and Koskala, who proved that if you have a doubling metric measure space, so I mean a, a, a metric measure space where the measure is doubling, and you know your space supports a 1p Poincaré inequality, then this Poincaré, Poincaré inequality self-improves to a qp Poincaré inequality. So you actually get something stronger just from, from doubling in the 1 Poincaré inequality. Okay? And given our techniques, um, Hiawas and I were able to prove uh, the following result, that in fact, doubling and, uh, I'm sorry, that QP Poincaré inequality, in fact, characterizes those metric measure spaces equipped with a doubling measure and a Poincaré inequality. Specifically, we proved that the following statements are equivalent, that your space, uh, that the measure on your space is doubling and supports a Poincaré inequality, and X supports a QP Poincaré inequality. So these two conditions are equivalent. Now, uh, the first line implying the second line is just high wash in, in Koskala's results. And so the main contribution is the fact that the second line implies the first line. 
So it's, it's from Helder that the QP Poincaré inequality implies Poincaré inequality. So the main contribution here is the fact that the QP Poincaré inequality implies the doubling measure. Okay. And that really is a, a celebration of the result due to Korbenko, Moldonado, and Enrios. Okay. All right. So now that we have this uh, characterization, we can uh, uh, apply it to uh, as an application here to, to what are called p-admissible weights, which some of you may be familiar with. So what is a p-admissible uh, uh, weight? So suppose I have a strictly uh, positive locally integrable function, and uh, I have a measure uh, associated to this function via integration. Then we'll say that this measure, which I denote here by mu, uh, is p-admissible provided the measure is doubling. Uh, the following uniqueness condition holds true, which is a sort of a technical condition uh, about the gradient. The following Sobolev inequality holds with some exponent Q bigger than P. And the following PP Poincaré inequality holds true. Okay. So why P admissible weights? Well, if you're interested in proving that a solution to say, uh, a degenerate elliptic PDE, where the degeneracy is governed by the weight uh, uh, W here. And you happen to know that the, the weight is P admissible, meaning these four conditions hold, then standard techniques can be used to show that these solutions are regular of, of, a, of, a, of a certain degree, like say held or continuous. So this would be the case for like the weighted P harmonic, for example, equation. So given the importance of these uh, four conditions, uh, there's been a lot of attention given to trying to clarify how these four conditions relate to one another. And in fact, it's been shown that condition one, the doubling in the PP Poincaré inequality in condition four, uh, imply the Sobolev inequality and also implies the uniqueness condition. Okay, and this has been proved in several different settings for uh, um, in various degrees of, of, of generality. Okay, by several different authors. But what we can see here is that all four conditions can be reduced to precisely the Dublin and the PP Poincaré inequality. Okay? But keeping in mind Hiwash and Koskala's self improvement result for PP Poincaré inequality, four can be slightly weakened as follows. They prove that from their result, it follows as a corollary that the, the weight is P admissible if and only if the measure associated with W is Dublin and the following 1p Poincaré inequality holds true, okay? So a priori, you can assume a weaker uh, Poincaré inequality uh, rather than the pp Poincaré inequality. But again, these latter two conditions, uh, the doubling and the 1p Poincaré inequality, we now know are equivalent to the qp Poincaré inequality. And so as a corollary of uh, Hiwaj and, and, and myself's uh, characterization, we can reduce all four conditions of P admissible weights into simply asking that the measure mu associated with the weight W satisfies uh, a QP uh, Poincaré inequality. Okay? And so we see here that results, although obtained in a metric setting, do have applications in the Euclidean setting. Okay? All right. So the last uh, sort of results uh, or sort of part of this talk uh, is going to bring us back to uh, uh, Sobolev extension domains, okay, uh, or Sobolev spaces in general, here uh, in the context of, of Sobolev extension domains, okay. So let's just recall uh, what do we mean by W1P extension domains in the Euclidean setting. So suppose I have some exponent P bigger than or equal to one, and I have a, a domain omega. So I mean open connected set when I say domain then uh, we'll call this domain a W1P extension domain provided each function in W1P defined on omega can be extended to the entire space with preservation of the smoothness class of W1P. But not only that, that these functions can be extended in a linear and bounded fashion. So we have control of the W1P on all of Rn of the extended function in terms of the W1P norm of the original function on, on omega. Now, just like the Sobolev embedding theorem, it's clear that the geometry is going to play a significant role in extending from omega out to the entire space, okay? And in fact, there is an intimate relationship between the, the regularity of the domain, as well as the extendability of these functions, 
So for example, uh, all Lipschitz domains are in fact W1P extension domains. This was a result due to Calderon in 61 for P in between one and infinity strictly and Stein uh, later in proved the range from one to infinity. And in fact, they proved this result for WKP uh, extension domains. Uh, but Calderon's, if you're familiar with the work, Calderon's uh, extension operator was degree dependent, whereas Stein's was degree independent. Okay. Now, this result was later extended to the class of so called epsilon delta domains, which are sort of locally connected domains. It's a technical condition, but you can think of them as sort of locally connected domains. Uh, in some quantitative sense. And so this was done in 81 by Peter Jones, okay? Now, so far, both of these classes of domains fit into the larger category of n thick domains, okay? So, so far, all the domains that are exhibited sort of are in this big category. Okay? So the natural question is, just as we asked for uh, Sobolev uh, embedding point, is what does the ability to extend W -E WP functions from omega to all of Rn imply about the properties of the underlying domain, in particular about the measure uh, on, on omega, in this case, the Lebesgue measure. Well, the same paper, uh, the JFA paper in 2008, Hayabusa, Koskala, and Tumanin proved the following result, that in an arbitrary domain in Rn, if you know that the, the domain is a W1P extension domain, then omega necessarily necessarily satisfies the lower measure condition here with this exponent n. Now, just as with the Sobolev embedding theorem, this measure condition alone is not enough to characterize W1P extension domains. However, they proved that this measure condition, in conjunction with asking that every function in W1P satisfies a certain Lipschitz type condition, is enough to characterize W1P extension domains. Okay. So remember that M1P extension dome, uh, I'm sorry, M1P spaces are a subspace of W1P. So really what we have here in this first line of the second theorem is asking that every function in W1P on omega belongs to M1P. And that's what I mean by every function in W1P satisfies some Lipschitz type condition uh, described in the definition of M1P spaces. Okay, so this result sort of almost begs an obvious question, okay? We know that the measure condition alone is not enough to characterize W1P extension domains, but is it enough to characterize M1P extension domains, okay? And this, of course, would be a, a, a question that could be formulated in metric spaces, okay? And so let's just quickly sort of state how that would look, okay? So suppose you have a metric measure space then you'll define M1P extension domains in exactly an analogous fashion, right? That there exists a linear and bounded operator from M1P on omega to all of M1P, uh, or to M1P on all of X. Okay. And to state the result, I need to introduce this Q all fours regular, uh, the V regular condition, which is asking that the measure not only satisfies a lower bound, but simultaneously an upper bound with the same exponent. So it amounts to saying that at all locations and all scales, your object here, your space X, acts like a Q-dimensional space, okay? Then uh, Hiwash, Koskala, and Tumanin in actually a different paper, not the JFA paper, proved the following uh, characterization of M1P extension domains. If you have a Q alphors regular geodesic metric measure space for some Q bigger than or equal to one and P bigger than or equal to one, then a domain, uh, the measure satisfies the lower measure bound on a domain if and only if it's an M1P extension domain. Now, in one implies two, they use the upper alphors regularity to conclude that the measure is doubling on omega and then construct a Whitney type extension operator. It's a very nice and simple uh, extension operator for the M1P functions. The geodesic condition is not needed in that implication. It's only needed in the, the converse direction. And why? Because you start with the M1P extension domains, you take a function in M1P on omega, you extend it to all of X, and then in that setting, use the Sobolev embedding theorems to conclude uh, the lower bound for the measure on, on omega. And so you can see here the geodesic condition was there to 
to allow them to sort of recycle the arguments from the Euclidean setting, okay? Remember this condition that the measure of the ball of one generation is exactly half the radius of the measure of the ball from the previous generation, okay? And so here we have um, the use of the geodesic condition only for that purpose, okay? But given the new techniques that Gorka, Haiwaj, and myself used, we can get around this geodesic condition and have the following result. So suppose I have a Q all for his regular space and uh, some domain omega with exponents Q bigger than or equal to one and same with P, okay? Then the, all of the following statements are equivalent. The measure mu on omega satisfies a lower bound with exponent Q on all balls. Omega is an M1P extension domain and omega is an M1P Sobolev embedding domain. And by M1P Sobolev embedding domain, I mean for a value of P, a fixed value of P, I ask that the corresponding Sobolev embedding holds on the domain. So in the case P less than Q, I mean something like this Sobolev Poincare inequality holds for M1P function on the dilated balls. Okay. So one if and only if three was the first part of this talk. There's nothing new there. One implies two was the result of Hiwash, Koskala, and Tumanin um, because they did not need the geodesic condition. And so the new sort of part here is two implies one. And again, the reason that we were able to eliminate the geodesic condition is because we use the extension to go through the Sobolev embedding back to the measure, measure condition. So hence eliminating the uh, geodesic uh, condition. And this sort of wraps together the first part and uh, the last part altogether. Um, and so the loop is complete. And so that will be sort of a good place to talk. So thank you. Thank you very much.